students, class of 2025, and all of our guests who are joining us from home via live stream to the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine's White Coat Ceremony for our class of 2025. I'm Dr. John Zubialdi, the Executive Dean of the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine, and it's my distinct pleasure to provide, preside tonight over this important ceremony. Students, this is the culmination of your orientation to our medical school. It's no surprise that we have repeatedly emphasized professionalism and what it means to be a part of the profession of medicine. Today is another important step in tangibly recognizing our dedication to the noble principles and the ethics of the medical profession. This is symbolized tonight by the donning of a white coat. The white coat ceremony also emphasizes a commitment to the lifelong study of medicine. This is of a foundational importance to providing the highest quality of care to the people that we serve. We're also joined tonight by a number of key individuals each of whom I will introduce to you as we go forward. All of us here today, both those of us who are here in person and those who are joining us by video, we warmly welcome each and every one of you as we celebrate your achievements and begin this next chapter of your educational journey. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank the many individuals who served on the OU College of Medicine's admissions board. This is the board that recommended you for admission to this class. We're deeply appreciative to each of them for the many hours of service that's required to bring forward a new class. It's truly a labor of love, and to that we are so grateful. While we are celebrating today a new beginning, we should all also remember that in just four short years, the class of 2025 will become graduates of our medical school and also alumni of the College of Medicine. It's truly gratifying to tell you that when that day comes, we have an active and enthusiastic alumni association that serves our college very well. 
We're ever grateful to our Alumni Association for all they do for the College of Medicine and in the support of all of you, our students. It's with that that I'm now pleased to introduce to you Dr. Jason Lees, who is president of the College of Medicine Alumni Association. A native of Edmond, Oklahoma, Dr. Lees attended the University of Oklahoma, from which he graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor of Science in Zoology. He received his medical degree at the OU College of Medicine, and after graduating, completed his residency at the University of Oklahoma in general surgery. During his residency, he spent two years as a research fellow at the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation and also in the Department of Surgery Research Labs. He then went on to complete a critical care fellowship in surgery at Jackson Memorial Hospital at the University of Miami in 2006. Upon completion, we are very glad that he chose to return to Oklahoma. In addition to being the Surgery Residency Program Director since the year 2011, he serves as the Vice Chair of Academic Affairs for the department since 2018, and also as the President of the College of Medicine Alumni Association. Would you all please take the opportunity now to join me in welcoming Dr. Jason Lees. I think of last year and the times in doing this uh, in my role as the Alumni Association President. And the good thing about last year, it was teleprompted. So every time I got to repeat when I messed it up, so y'all are gonna have to deal with all my mumblings and so forth. But um, it's a lot better, even though we're still in very uncertain times, to at least be in person in some degree. And I'm very honored to be um, representing the Alumni Board uh, in, this, uh, in this role. Kind of the best of times, the worst of times. It's somewhat cliche. But again, I think as you're entering medical school, uh, it's very applicable to these current times. Um, <clears throat> but uh, as we learn more about COVID and are progressing, and again, being more in person, um, I think we're seeing more of the, the good times. Medicine is no different. It can be exhilarating and humbling all in the same day, in the same moment, with the same patient. We've all experienced the thrill of saving a patient through an intervention or challenging diagnosis to be humbled a short time later with a complication or a death. As you start down this path, please realize the stresses and challenges that, <clears throat> in acquiring the skill and knowledge that ultimately benefit the patients who will trust their lives with you and the confidence to do so. I realize that this isn't always obvious along all points on this path. Um, I think back to my first year in medical school uh, in 1995, when the Murrow Building uh, bombing occurred. Um, I realize that's probably before many of you all were born, and that kind of uh, reflects on my age. But that evening, I remember walking down the streets of Oklahoma City. Um, it was somewhat chaotic still at that time, and really didn't have any idea how to help. Uh, I'd taken anatomy class in biochemistry, but that was completely inapplicable at that point in time. Um, but realizing the uncertainty and um, really being nervous about what this really meant, it's kind of uh, interesting to reflect back on that, that from that moment we came, you know, our city kind of rebirthed. We had new infrastructure, um, buildings, the thunder, and ironically, from my perspective, um, the, um, <clears throat> the, some of the groundwork that led to our becoming a trauma center which at the time, I'll be honest, I had no idea I wanted to do surgery, let alone be a trauma surgeon. So for everyone who has no idea what they want to do, um, that's not going to come really quickly. At least it didn't for me. Um, but now trauma is a big emphasis of our program and our academic medical center. And it's um, something that I never thought I'd be part of. So um, at some point, I think they will all be able to reflect on these challenges. Um, and I still remember the people I walked around with that evening. One's a urologist in Lawton, one's a Haymont physician in Seattle. And likewise, this day with your classmates and this week uh, will never be forgotten. It's not just knowledge and experiences that you acquire over the next few years, but lifelong friends. This will, be, be, will perhaps be the last time you have a shared experience with such a large group of people 
with whom you have com uh, common developmental experiences and all the stories, good and bad, that go along with them. So please enjoy it along the way. Four, now, four years from now, when you're entering residency, hopefully, um, as physicians, you'll realize that you're part of a profession that was forged by generations before you, not just what you've accomplished. So um, um, I think that kind of makes me think of the Alumni Association and what it means to have a college of medicine, University of Oklahoma College of Medicine degree uh, from all the alumni at our institution. So in closing, I still remember the first white care uh, ceremony that I attended as a fourth year medical student uh, as, a, uh, as an usher and how impactful it was. It was new at the time. I remember Dr. Candler being part of that. Um, and it was actually held at St. Luke's Church. And this weekend, I was at a funeral there, uh, <clears throat> a funeral of one of our faculty and alumni, Dr. Martin Payton. And hearing the stories of him and his influence and contributions for over an hour, it reminded me of the impact that you're going to be able to have in this profession, more so than many others uh, that you could have entered. So please carry that on, whether in the treatment of your patient at the bedside, in the operating room or procedural suite, diagnosing through microscopes or images, advocating for better health care to our policymakers, developing a greater understanding of human disease while developing new cures and treatments, teaching the next generation, or even leading us through the next round of challenges. So as president of the OU College of Medicine Alumni Association, I welcome you into medicine and look forward to your making the future the best of times. So be impactful, make a difference. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Lees. College of Medicine also enjoys an excellent relationship with the Oklahoma State Medical Association. And we're truly grateful for their friendship and strong support of our college and our students. Today, we welcome Dr. Mary Clark, president of the Oklahoma State Medical Association. A native Oklahoman, Mary uh, Clark, MD, earned her bachelor's degree at the University of Central Oklahoma before attending the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine. Dr. Clark then completed her family medicine residency in Wisconsin, where she was also named as chief resident and outstanding senior. She then practiced in the Dallas area for four years before returning to Oklahoma in 2008 to establish her practice in Stillwater. Previous to her selection as the fourth female president of the Oklahoma State Medical Association, Dr. Clark served as the speaker of the House of Delegates vice president and president-elect of the organization. She is also an active member of the Oklahoma Academy of Family Physicians and, we'll have to forgive her for this, an avid Oklahoma State Cowboys fan. So would you please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Clark, president of the Oklahoma State Medical Association. Wow, it is really, really nice to be here today with everyone. Um, I, Dr. Zubialdi, Zubialdi did say that I am a diehard OSU fan. However, I wore my red tonight um, because I'm also a um, OU medical school graduate. That was a few years ago. What Dr. Zubialdi did not mention is that I was actually an intern uh, when he was at the family medicine uh, department. So that was a wonderful, wonderful time for me. Um, we at the Oklahoma State Medical Association work in many different ways to improve the health of all Oklahomans. That is one of our groundbreaking mission statements. It cannot happen alone. It cannot happen without people like you to be involved. Uh, as a medical student, a first year medical student, I became involved with the Medical Association. And as I moved around from Wisconsin to Texas, I continued my state associations and my family practice associations through every state. I cannot tell you how important it is that 
You are the future of medicine. Everything you do, starting from today with the white coat, will be how you are as a physician and a person as you grow. It does not end with your graduation. It continues on in residency, and it will continue on for the rest of your life as you are physicians in whatever specialty you decide to go into. Your practice of medicine with your patients is going to be one like none other. There is no other, no other profession that has the ability that people trust in us absolutely. Now I know with COVID, there's a lot of dark times, there's a lot of misinformation that we have been having to deal with, but patients will trust you with their lives and they will love you for it. This is something that you will have to carry on as the next generation, well after me, well after Dr. Zubialdi. You are going to be faculty, you are going to be practicing physicians like I am. Some of you will go on to be executives of corporations, hospitals. It is always going to be 100% important that you stay involved with your medical schools, your residencies, your medical associations, because we are all in this as a team. The rules and the laws and the, the things that are made at the state capitol are things that you will be dealing with for the rest of your life. So being involved and being one of those to help shape what the future of medicine will be is going to be up to you. It is absolutely wonderful to be here. I can't tell you how excited I am to be able to be a part of the White Coat Ceremony as, as the Medical Association President. I hope all of you um, have a wonderful four years. We can all look back and say how wonderful our four years in medical school was, even though it was very tough. Um, it will be a challenge, but this is going to be the best four, probably the best four years of your life. Please stay involved. And I hope you guys have a wonderful evening. Thank you so much for having me around. Thank you so much, Dr. Clark. It's now my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for our ceremony this evening. Dr. Carl Hansen, MD, PhD, is professor and chair of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. He also holds the James A. Merrill Chair in Obstetrics and Gynecology. Since completing his residency at the University of Oklahoma and fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility at the University of Washington, he has successfully developed a strong reproductive endocrinology and infertility program that provides service, research, and education. Dr. Hansen's research efforts have focused on the reproductive aging process in women and improving outcomes for couples with unexplained infertility. He's also the, currently the principal investigator of the Reproductive Medicine Collaborative Clinical Trials Program. In addition to his research, Dr. Hansen reviews and is an editorial board member for multiple reproductive sciences journals. He has authored over 150 peer-reviewed manuscripts and published abstracts. His expressed goal is to facilitate practice and research opportunities for members of the specialty of obstetrics and gynecology and reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Carl Hansen. Good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Great, thank you. Well, Dr. Zubialdi, Dr. Sanders, faculty members, guests, 
family members who are joining us remotely, and importantly, the OU College of Medicine class of 2025, welcome. I'm humbled and honored to have the opportunity to speak with you today at our White Coat Ceremony. The White Coat Ceremony is a wonderful event dating back to the 1990s and celebrated here at OU since 1997. It is the rite of passage for you as medical students, signifying your entrance into the medical profession. I attended the OU College of Medicine in the early 90s, in fact, starting in 1990. And at that time, the initiation to the College of Medicine consisted of a trip to the zoo, a hot dog and a Coke is my recollection. <laughs> and I actually thinking about it, I think the Oklahoma State Medical Association is the one who put that event on. So your initiation has most certainly taken a turn for the better. I've participated in this event for many years now, and usually I'm seated in the front row with the other clinical department chairs, and I participate in cloaking the students. I've noticed through the years that while my height remains exactly the same, the students every year seem taller and taller to the point at some point I'm going to require a step stool. <laughs> However, I, I seem to be spared that for this year because I'm not participating in cloaking unless we're short anyone. So when I was approached to give this presentation, an inspiring speech for the incoming medical student class, I thought back to what inspired me to pursue a career in medicine and how those factors, same understanding and values drive my activities today and how I could share them with you. Indeed, much of it is a deep love for science and medicine, patient care, impacting the lives of our patients, families, and community. I hope all of those things are true for you as well. But today I wanna to focus on some factors that drive me even now, and in my years of serving in medical education can help elevate a physician, create separation, and help a physician reach their full potential. I've organized my presentation around these four themes. Number one, everything you do is a reflection of you. Number two, be a part of discovery. Number three, be a leader. And number four, find your passion. Everything you do is a reflection of you. For many years now, as an interviewer for OBGYN residents and fellows, we've been using behavioral interview questions. Most of you are familiar with this style of questioning designed to standardize interviews and gain insights into a person's character. Well, I've never been asked many of these questions myself. I frequently consider how I would answer them. One in particular relates to identifying a prior failure. What was it? What did you do about it? And how did everything turn out? I was reminded of a time when I wasn't satisfied with my performance as a graduate student and how this experience impacts my activities today. I was a dual degree student here at OU pursuing both the MD and PhD degrees. The format was that I completed the first two years of medical school. Then I took a break to complete my PhD work and then returned for the third and fourth years. And my PhD was in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. As part of my PhD degree, I was required to take the second year graduate coursework in microbiology and immunology. Now I'd done very well in the first two years of medical school, and so I didn't really consider this to be much of a challenge. Basically, I felt like I already knew all I needed to know about microbiology and immunology. I just wanted to work on my research project, and the coursework was honestly just a task to complete. As I started one of my graduate courses, I wasn't performing very well because honestly, I wasn't spending any time on it at all. In fact, I do recall the statement being made, did you even open your book for this assignment? I didn't and still don't consider myself a slacker, so this assessment did not sit very well with me. And I realized how that performance could impact how I was perceived, not only in that setting, but others as well, regardless of my feelings about the course and its importance. I redirected my efforts and ultimately did very well in that class, but it was an important lesson. Everything you do is a reflection of you, even if you think the task doesn't matter. As I entered the third year of medical school, I reflected on my interactions with patients. One has a limited window of time to have an impact on patient care. Would I give it my all or would I simply go through the motions? How will you be remembered? Will you impair your ability to impact a patient's care due to a lack of total effort? Quite simply, it is what you do that defines you. Today, if I say I will do a task, I give it my best effort, even if I think it isn't a high priority. I hope you'll do the same. Remember, your reputation will follow you, and in many cases, it will precede you. Be a part of discovery. 
As students who have embarked on a long training pathway, all of you are very familiar with delayed gratification, or you soon will be. It is a long road. <laughs> you are now seven years away from being done with your formal training for those who complete a shorter residency training program. If that sounds like a long time, I will confess that I've completed 14 years of postgraduate education. At some point, you just have to consider your ongoing training a job in conversations with friends and family. However, early in your training, you will see the rewards of patient care, immediate feedback on your efforts. As a graduate student, I spent a whole year trying to clone a gene. After this long and painful process, when I was finally successful, I remember reading the sequence of the gene all the A's, T's, G's, and C's, and writing them down by hand, and recognizing that I was the first person to ever read it. This powerful moment, this joy in the moment of revelation, is an experience that I will never forget. To quote Dr. Rick Legro, a friend of mine and mentor at Penn State University, I believe that there is in every medical student the desire for revelation which draws them to medicine. Sometimes it is a lingering doubt about an illness to oneself or a loved one that yields the desire to seek a better outcome. Sometimes it is a pure curiosity about the illness without a personal link. Often because of its intimacy, this desire for revelation remains unspoken, save for the early obligatory essays and interviews, which may touch upon this as a reason for a medical career, but it becomes buried under responsibilities and the many other demands of the profession. But this spark is essential to maintain and nurture. What question that will improve our health and well being do you want to answer with your career? Without the possibility for revelation, burnout becomes inevitable. To quote Yvonne Thornton, physician and Pulitzer Prize nominated author whether you go into research, business, law, medicine, public service, or education, neither you nor society can continue to survive and prosper simply by implementing what is already known. Somebody is going to have to come up with meaningful new ideas, creative new approaches and important new discoveries. Why can't that somebody be you? Don't just practice the standard of care as we know it today. Be part of creating the next standard of care. Today, my research is not basic science oriented, but I've been a part of meaningful clinical research for over 20 years. You can too. Be a part of discovery in your career. Be a leader. As a medical student, it is incredibly easy to be all consumed in your own pathway, your own development to the exclusion of those around you. But your formal training will come to an end. Where will you be then and what will you be doing? Recognizing that we are all dedicated to helping others. When I hear this statement in an interview, I push deeper. How do we extend this dedication and desire to the development of others, our colleagues? You will have the opportunity to give back Actually, you will have many opportunities. How will you mentor others, perhaps trainees under you? Participating in the development of others, mentoring them, is one of the most satisfying aspects of my job as a department chair. Understand that being a leader of a team is not just telling others what to do. That person is called a boss. Learners, colleagues, students, co-residents, and staff, they need your leadership and guidance. They don't need another boss. A leader provides that guidance and resources and allows the mentee the opportunity to grow under supervision, being held accountable for what they control, but not for what they don't control. It should be the natural evolution of the learner becoming the teacher. Be a leader, be giving of your time and contribute to the development of those around you. Find your passion. For most students entering medical school, a decision on what specialty to pursue has not been made. The lone exception is orthopedic surgeons <laughs> who have known their calling for many years before entering medical school and sometimes even grade school. Those of you in the audience, you know who you are. But for most students, this isn't the case. I've heard it said before that the process of deciding on a specialty is one of elimination. You eliminate the specialties you can't stand and you choose from the remaining that are tolerable. Well, I can imagine this happens. I sincerely hope that this isn't the case for you. I'm a specialist in reproductive endocrinology and infertility, a subspecialty of obstetrics and gynecology. Well, I was fascinated with the technology of IVF before I entered medical school. 
and my interest in genetics saw the possibility for future breakthroughs in the treatment of disease through this specialty. I honestly never thought I would like obstetrics and gynecology well enough to even pursue subspecialty training in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. Thankfully, I kept an open mind throughout my clinical rotations, and I loved obstetrics and gynecology. I loved the patients, I loved labor and delivery, the surgery, the endocrinology and continuity. And I also had the privilege of working with residents and faculty who exhibited the mentoring skills that we discussed earlier. In short, I can't imagine doing anything else today. While I recognize that my area of medicine is certainly not for everyone, I take great pride in the fact that I'm in the business of building families. I absolutely found the correct area of medicine to pursue, and it is my great hope that you will as well. To the class of 2025, it has been an honor to speak with you tonight, and I know I speak for all of the faculty in saying welcome to the OU College of Medicine and the noble profession of medicine. We look forward to getting to know you, mentoring you, and your future successes. Congratulations and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansen. Those are inspiring words and so true. And from the speakers that you've heard tonight, you, you've understood that really this is a process of learning, process of innovation, leading and participating in the larger cause. So all of these things are part of the profession of medicine. And what a great introduction. Thanks to all of our speakers for helping us in that regard. Would all of you um, now join me again? This is the time that you are all here for, that you have waited for. It's a time that both you and your families have been preparing for for many years. We formally welcome you as the class of 2025 into the profession of medicine as symbolized by the donning of a white jacket. This activity is both an important step and a very clear statement from you to the community. By donning these white coats, each of you formally accepts the responsibilities and the obligations of becoming a medical student. It also is an acknowledgement of the rich history and traditions and ethics of our profession. Today, you fully commit to the journey of becoming a physician. To preside over our cloaking ceremony, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Mark Ferguson, person that you already know well, Associate Professor of Pediatrics and also Associate Dean for Student Affairs. Dr. Ferguson and the Student Affairs staff are responsible, as you well know, for planning and implementing all of the activities related to your student life. This includes tonight's includes the 2025 orientation sessions and of course tonight's white coat ceremony. Before we begin cloak the cloaking ceremony, I would like to explain a bit about the unique aspect of our medical school here at the University of Oklahoma. That is our module system. It is a central part of the culture at the OU College of Medicine. It's where you as students learn together in small groups called modules and also support each other throughout the first two years of your medical school journey. It's in that order of modules that you will be participating tonight in this cloaking ceremony. And you will also learn about your modules and the history of those modules this evening as well. Each of you will then be called forward by your module and cloaked by our, our department chairs and faculty who are here to participate with us in this ceremony tonight. Dr. Ferguson, would you come forward and please announce each module individually. Thank you, Dr. Zubialdi. Students of the William Osler MD module will now come forward to be cloaked.
Dr. William Osler received his medical degree from McGill University and became the second of four original faculty members of the new Johns Hopkins Hospital Medical School. He was renowned for his clinical expertise, his gift for teaching, moving medical education from classroom activity into the world of patient care. Dr. Osler was also known for developing the prototype of our current system of resident education. His writings on medical education and the life as a physician remain an inspiration to this day. Dr. Osler is commonly regarded as the father of the specialty of internal medicine. Students of the William Osler MD module, welcome to the profession of medicine. <laughs> Students of the Everett Rhodes MD module will now come forward to be clothed. Dr. Everett Rhodes was born in Lawton, Oklahoma and graduated from the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine in 1956. Dr. Rhodes is a member of the Kiowa Nation and was the first Kiowa to receive a medical degree. In 1982, he became the first American Indian appointed director of the Indian Health Service, serving until his retirement in March of 1993. Dr. Rhodes then returned to OU where he served as associate dean of both the College of Medicine and the College of Public Health. Dr. Rhodes has been a tireless educator leader and advocate for Native American health in Oklahoma and all across the nation. Students of the Everett Road MD module, welcome to the profession of medicine. Students of the William Stewart Halstead MD module are now coming forward to be cloaked. Dr. William Stewart Halstead was the first chairman of surgery when the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine was organized in the late 1800s. Dr. Halstead was the first to demonstrate the principle of nerve blocking, a great step forward in rendering minor operations painless. Perhaps Dr. Halstead's greatest service was his skillful development of new surgical techniques. He was widely respected as the leading surgical teacher of his time. Students of the William Stewart Halstead MD module, welcome to the profession of medicine. Take, take a moment here for our, um, our next group of chairs to come forward. Students of the Rebecca Lee Crumpler module are now in place to be cloaked. Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler was born in 1831 in Delaware. Inspired by her aunt, who nursed neighbors and community members, she was admitted to the New England Female Medical College in 1860. 
When she graduated in 1864, Dr. Crumpler was the first African-American woman in the United States to earn an MD degree. At the conclusion of the Civil War, she moved her practice to Virginia and began providing medical care for freed slaves for the Freedmen's Bureau, where she faced harsh racism as an African-American doctor in the post-war South. Dr. Crumpler focused her care on women and children, and in 1883, she published a book of medical discourses. Her book is one of the very first medical publications by an African-American. Students of the Rebecca Lee Crumpler MD module, welcome to the profession of medicine. <laughs> Students of the Malcolm Elsa Phelps MD module are now coming forward to be cloaked. Dr. Malcolm Elsa Phelps received his MD degree in 1929 from the University of Iowa. Dr. Phelps practiced then in El Reno, Oklahoma from 1931 to 1968. Dr. Phelps served as special advisor to the Surgeon General, field director of the American Medical Association's volunteer physicians in Vietnam, and vice president of the American Medical Association. Dr. Phelps was named to the Oklahoma Hall of Fame in 1967, and in 1974, he helped establish the Department of Family Practice and Community Medicine at our own College of Medicine. Dr. Phelps' efforts nationally promoted the, promoted the recognition of family medicine as a specialty. Students of the Malcolm Elsa Phelps MD module, Welcome to the profession of medicine. <laughs> Students of the Benjamin Rush MD module are now coming forward to be cloaked. Dr. Benjamin Rush earned his medical degree from Edinburgh University in 1768. And as a member of the Provincial Congress of 1776, he even signed the Declaration of Independence. Appointed by Congress as Surgeon General of the Medical Department of the Continental Army, Dr. Rush published a pamphlet entitled, Directions for Preserving the Health of Soldiers, an excellent exposition of the rules of military hygiene. Probably his best known book is his Medical Inquiries and Observations on the Diseases of the Mind, which led to wide recognition of Benjamin Rush as the father of psychiatry in America. Students of the Benjamin Rush MD module, welcome to the profession of medicine. Okay, our next group of chairs will we'll, um, get ready to, to come up and cloak. Thank you, chairs. <laughs> Students of the Elizabeth Blackwell MD module are now coming forward to be cloaked. Born in 1821, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell's lifelong passion for medicine was met with rejection by 29 medical schools. Although she was accepted into the Geneva Medical College in New York by a vote of the students, believing that her application was not serious. Her classmates were soon impressed by her ability and perseverance. Dr. Blackwell graduated first in her class in 1849 as the first woman medical graduate of an American medical school. Dr. Blackwell then opened a dispensary in the slums of New York City 
which became the New York Infirmary for Women and Children. Dr. Blackwell's personal example, lectures and book entitled Medicine as a Profession for Women inspired others to follow her lead. Students of the Elizabeth Blackwell MD module, welcome to the profession of medicine. Students of the Helen Brooke Talsig MD module are now coming forward to be cloaked. Dr. Helen Brooke Talsig was born in 1898 and was one of few women physicians in that area attending the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, where she later became professor of pediatrics. Dr. Talsig studied heart problems in pediatric patients suffering from rheumatic fever and congenital heart disease. Dr. Towson collaborated with Dr. Alfred Blaylock, chairman of surgery at Hopkins, in devising surgical correction for tetralogy of flow, a disabling heart condition. The blaylock talsic procedure has continued and endures to this time. Dr. Towson was one of the most highly regarded women physicians in the world. <laughs> Students of the Helen Brook Towsick MD module, welcome to the profession of medicine. <laughs> Students of the Stuart George Wolf Jr. Um, MD module are now coming forward to be cloaked. Stuart George Wolf Jr., MD, earned his bachelor's degree from Yale and his medical degree from Johns Hopkins in 1934. Dr. Wolf was an outstanding faculty clinician and researcher in internal medicine at Cornell School of Medicine. In 1952, Dr. Wolf became the first full time chairman of a department in our own medical school, serving as chairman of the Department of Medicine and a faculty leader until 1967. A truly outstanding medical scholar and human being, Dr. Wolf was internationally known, energetic and quite charismatic, inspiring many generations of students and faculty with his visionary leadership. Students of the Stuart George Wolf Jr. MD module, welcome to the profession of medicine. Okay, our chairs may also now be seated. Thank you all so much for your help. And Dr. Zubialdi, I'm pleased to present the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine, class of 2025. Thank you so much, Dr. Ferguson. And again, welcome class of 2025 to the profession of medicine. We are so deeply proud of you. Students, when you graduate from this college, you will take an oath as physicians, an oath for entering the profession of medicine and an oath that stems from the time of Hippocrates. Today, as you begin your study of medicine, we also ask that you take a student oath of commitment as those who have gone before you in your college each year have also done. The student oath is printed on page 15 of your program. So if you can get that out. 
Would you also please stand? I will read each statement and then you will repeat after me. As I embark upon the study of medicine at the University of Oklahoma College of Medicine, I promise to myself and to all here present that I will. Enter into a relationship of mutual respect with my teachers, colleagues, and staff. As I strive to acquire the knowledge, skills, and virtues of a good physician. Require self-discipline, honesty, and professionalism of myself. And expect no less from those with whom I work. Maintain the trust expected of a physician. The confidentiality required by patients. And the judgment to know the proper limits of my competence. Respect the humanity of those patients who allow me to learn this profession through their illnesses. Always demonstrating my compassion and willingness. To place their appropriate needs before my own. Value the knowledge and wisdom of those physicians who have preceded me. Endeavor to contribute to this tradition. And continue to learn and teach all the days of my life. Thank you. Please be seated. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce you to one of our third year medical students, Gage Calhoun. Gage is from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and a graduate of Oklahoma State University, where he earned a Bachelor of Business Administration and Finance. Throughout his time with us, Gage has demonstrated the high standards of personal integrity and academic achievement. Gage continues to enthusiastically serve his class, the OU College of Medicine, and the OUHSC campus as a dedicated student and as a leader. He is currently president of the OU College of Medicine Student Council, and we have invited Gage to welcome his fellow students this evening. Please join me in welcoming Gage Calhoun. Hello, class of 2025. On behalf of the student body, I'm incredibly happy to have the opportunity to welcome you guys as deserving members of the College of Medicine at OU. The road to medical school is not an easy one, and each of you has definitely put in a lot of work to be here. This is also an opportunity that we know doesn't get given to just anybody. So my piece of advice now is to cherish it and to capitalize on it. As many of us know, medical school can be quite rigorous and challenging. Um, it takes a lot of work at times. You're going to learn a lot over the next four years. And trust me, at times you're gonna be learning a lot more than you'd particularly like to be. <laughs> I think it's important that you guys realize that one thing you're gonna learn a lot more about that you haven't thought is yourself. You're gonna learn a lot more about what your passions are in this field. You're gonna learn a lot more about how you take on stress you're gonna learn how you overcome challenges. These are really important things to focus on as you move through this. 
Over the past couple of weeks, I've been talking to my classmates about what advice they would like to give to themselves at their own white coat ceremony. And I wanted to share with you guys some of my, some of the better ones. The first one that I enjoyed was start, and I quote, start slow on the coffee. Once you build up a tolerance, there aren't many legal alternatives. <laughs> But the first and most serious one that I really liked was just one word, participate. Participate in class, participate outside of class, and participate at home. I say participate in class not because Dean Zubialdi and Dr. Ferguson are looking at me right now. I say that because we learned over the last year the opportunity to learn socially and learn in person may not always be available. That is something that can easily get taken for granted. So I encourage you when you have the opportunity Go to class, study on campus, immerse yourself in the academic environment. You will truly enjoy it. <laughs> when I get asked by people what medical school is like, I always tell them that I'm just amazed at how supported I constantly feel by the faculty, the staff, and the facilities. This is truly a place that wants nothing more than to watch each and every single one of us succeed in our goals and objectives. So participate in it feed into its energy and come and have heart in it. <laughs> Moving on, I say participate outside of class. You'll, you will never again be surrounded by so many individuals that share your same passions and your same objectives. So take advantage of that, build relationships, go to social events and attend campus activities. You won't have this opportunity again. You can build some of the most remarkable relationships during your time in medical school some of the healthiest, most supportive, and most enduring ones. I think that these relationships are a vital, vital part of a holistic and emotionally successful medical school career. <laughs> Lastly, I say participate at home. Work now to build the work-life balance you wanna have later, and then maintain non-academic hobbies. Maintain these because they're healthy, they help you recharge and reboot, but also when you're with people outside of medical school, you can talk like a human about them. <laughs> the other piece of advice that I really liked was be open. During your time here, you're gonna be laying down the cornerstones of what I would say is your doctoring style. How you interact with colleagues and patients is really gonna be just a conglomeration of observations you make of others doing that exact same thing. So be open to as many examples of that as you possibly can. can that will allow you to put together your own template of how you want to practice medicine in the future. Lastly, and unfortunately cliche, I would say make sure that you try and compete with yourself and not with others. Nobody else has the same goals, the same objectives, the same mindset, desires the same workload, or wants to do the same things as you. It can be kind of easy to get obsessed with the performance of others, but really if all you do is focus on doing better every day, learning more every day, doing better with the next, pa next patient than you did with the last, then in the end, you're not really gonna have to learn about your performance and that's gonna show. That's a mentality that'll carry through. I wanna leave you with this. Bookmark in your minds how you feel this evening. Take a little bit of time to reflect on your emotions of excitement. Take some time to take pride in your accomplishments and then focus on your readiness to begin your career in medicine. Um, you are beginning one of the most rigorous graduate programs there is. And I think it's really important to realize that not everybody gets that opportunity. It's very unique to get that. So make sure that as you move through it, you just endorse one thing, and that's being happy to be here. Thank you guys for giving me the opportunity to welcome you. This is a very special evening for you all, and I'm happy to be here. I look forward to working with each of you as we all grow towards being excellent, compassionate, and impactful physicians. I think you took off with mine. <laughs> oh, always good to have a little laugh. Thank you so much. That was truly great. Um, Gage, really appreciate that. And I think, uh, class, please recognize that this is the, um, you've got a, a great group of peers like Gage and others who really are here to help support you through this journey as well. And so please take advantage of 
of getting to know each of these folks as well. So class 20 of 2025, we come to the close of our ceremony this evening, a very special event for you and your families. Monday, you will begin your classwork. But I also like to take this time to thank all of those who joined us this evening, both physically and virtually for our ceremony. For our faculty, and also for those of you who are joining us from home and virtually, thank you very much for being here to support our class. I'd like, like to take this time to also have our class of 2025 stand up. Um, where's the live camera? Okay, over here. If you would, please just give all of those who are uh, at home and watching you a round of applause and a great day. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to say all of you who are joining us from home that uh, each and every one of you will also be truly key in helping our students be successful through the years to come. So thank you so much for your, your love and presence with them. We wish that you could have been here with us in person. Class of 2025, I proudly tonight welcome you to the profession of medicine. Faculty, if you would, join me in standing, and I present to you in giving a round of applause to our class of 2025. Thank you all very much. So we are at the conclusion of our program tonight. I think uh, just a bit of a word of housekeeping is, if I am correct, Logan, where's Logan? Logan, are we going to go ahead and do module photographs? Okay, so at this point in time, we will formally end our ceremony, but if each of you all, we just, be, just wait to be seated. We're going to bring you down by module to go ahead and do the module photographs. So we're dismissed. Thank you all very much for being with us this evening. Well, I did. Well, so, yeah.